Um, so yeah, people can just join us uh, as we uh, as we start here. So my name is Leslie Ann Drake. I'm the curator of collections at the History Center uh, in downtown Orlando. Um, and I am coming to you from my living room uh, because I am mostly teleworking um, to bring you this presentation um, about just some Central Florida stories that I really enjoyed learning about. Um, I am a Florida girl born and raised, <laughs> um, but obviously there was a lot about Central Florida history, especially the you know, quirkier side of Florida history that I didn't get to learn in school. So when I came to the History Center um, about a little over three years ago, um, I was really excited to <laughs> learn about some of these interesting, um, sometimes wacky, sometimes just really interesting and mind-blowing stories that I'd never heard before. So that is the thread that carries this through. <laughs> That's the only connection <laughs> between these stories is that they all, you know, take place or relate to Central Florida. And um, I found all of them really interesting. So I hope you enjoy this kind of hodgepodge presentation that I'm bringing you here. <laughs> okay, so let's just jump into it. The first story I want to talk about um, is one that I researched um, for a article in our quarterly magazine, Reflections. If um, you become a member, you will get Reflections magazine delivered to your home. And um, there's always some great stories in there. So um, this one is on <laughs> the story of Windover Pond. Um, this is a photo of Windover Pond as it looked in 1985. Um, and I can confirm that it still pretty much looks like this today because I, I went out to it. I, you know, climbed through the woods <laughs> um, to see what it looked like. Um, it's just a pond. Um, it's in Titusville, um, but it's remarkable uh, for a number of reasons uh, relating to what is buried within this pond. In 1982, uh, a housing, uh, a developer who was building housing uh, community there, um, discovered bones. Uh, he didn't know what to make of them. He uh, <laughs> took them to the police, took them to the county coroner. Um, they were like, these are ancient. These are not modern humans. So, um, you know, they're, they're not really our business <laughs> at this point. Um, and at that point, he could have, like, you know, kind of done a number of different things. Um, but what he did, which is unusual for a developer, is he called in an archaeologist, um, which, I mean, you know, for a developer to find, um, you know, bones in their development, um, that's bad news for the developer. Um, and so it was really remarkable that, you know, he cared enough about history and about just, you know, discovering what was there um, to try to find out more. So the archaeologist he called was Glenn Doran um, of Florida State University. And he, <laughs> when he saw what bones had been uncovered, he immediately thought, wow, these look really old because the, um, he could tell by the wear pattern on the, the teeth of uh, the, the skulls that were found um, that these were old because uh, prehistoric peoples, because they did a lot of they used their teeth as tools, but they also prepared their food using stone tools. It meant they like had a lot of grit on, in their diet. And all of this combined basically made their teeth wear down to nubs by the time they were middle aged. So by, by the wear pattern, how the teeth were so worn down, he thought these must be ancient peoples, uh, which wouldn't be unprecedented for Florida. There's actually a number of um, wet sites with ancient burials throughout the state, um, but uh, this was one, it, they're, they're notoriously hard to excavate and um, also technology when those other sites were discovered wasn't quite as advanced as they were when Windover was discovered. So um, Glenn Doran <laughs> decides to excavate this site um, and immediately they find some really cool things. Um, during the first field season, um, they're uncovering these burials and they actually are, they date them to over 7,000 years ago, um, which is crazy. Uh, when you think about that in terms of like world history, <laughs> I think the Egyptian, that's like 2,000 years older than the Egyptian pyramids. So these are extremely um, 
extremely old remains and one of the oldest burial sites like ever in, discovered in North America. So first of all, there's the age. <laughs> and then um, during the second field season, they discover, started discovering some um, remains that are so well preserved that there's actually intact brain tissue, uh, like actually fully intact brains inside the skulls. And you may be thinking, well, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. How could those be preserved for thousands and thousands of years? Well, I will, I will, say, I will spare you my lecture on how interesting <laughs> peat is, <laughs> but peat is actually really interesting. Um, peat is what forms when over, you know, hundreds, thousands of years, um, organic material decomposes uh, on top of, you know, one another, like you've got the dinosaurs, you've got, you know, leaves, you've got grass, you've got all of these, like, you know, other animal remains, it all, all the organic material becomes peat. Um, which is an anaerobic environment. There's no, there's no air <laughs> inside of it. So that means that um, something like, um, you know, a, a body uh, buried in a, um, you know, pond cemetery uh, composed of peat um, isn't going to decompose because the air isn't there to, to affect it and affect the decomposition process. So that's um, a basic, <laughs> sorry if I said anything wrong, if there's any scientists on this call who are like, no, she's totally wrong. But no, that's base, a basic overview for the layman of what peat is. <laughs> oh, I see someone's making. Uh, can you share again where Windover Pond is located? Windover Pond is um, located in Titusville. So it's over near the coast, Brevard County. Um, there's actually a really great exhibit on Windover uh, over at the Brevard Museum of Natural History. I think that's what it's called. Uh, but it's over there. Um, uh, not that far away from where we are <laughs> right now. <laughs> so they found these, um, they found these remains, they found these intact brains, which was amazing. Um, but it wasn't until I, like the third field season when they started discovering even more uh, things that were fascinating. Here's a, an overview of the ex excavation. Um, wet sites are really hard to excavate because of you know, the water. They had to pump out enough water that they could get down in there and see what was there, but not so much water that everything dried out. Um, if bones are dried out too quickly, they will crack. Um, not to mention um, everything is, it, it's, you know, dried out too quickly, it could start decomposing very, very rapidly. So they had to be very careful with how they designed the ex uh, excavation. And here's actually a, another excavation, excavation photo showing um, what they call their pedestaling of burial, um, which is where they will carve out the whole area around a burial so they can uh, then you know, excavate those remains um, intact and preserve where they are in the, in the excavation and all of that good stuff that tells archeologists about the context. So, um, what they found um, in the, in, towards the end of the excavation process, um, this is in the 80s, this is 1986-ish, um, what they found was that people had been using this pond cemetery to bury their dead for generations. Um, they were essentially wrapped in cloth, um, submerged into the pond, and stakes were used to keep them on the bottom of the pond. Um, and they would continue coming back to this site seasonally to uh, bury their dead um, in this pond. And within these bundles, there was all kinds of um, really interesting things um, like tools, uh, tools made out of um, a lot of antler and wooden tools, um, things for hunting, fishing, sewing. Um, and actually, the, they did recover some of the oldest like intact pieces of cloth ever discovered in North America, um, showing that they had different weaving techniques for different types of material. I mean, these things existed before then, but this is like the oldest physical examples that we have of some of these things. Um, they found um, evidence that uh, there was, uh, they were, were caring for their sick and their elderly. Even though this is prehistoric times and people tended to die pretty young, um, there were people who had, uh, clearly had uh, diseases and had illnesses and, you know, possibly even were using medicinal plants um, and things like that. Um, and they knew about 
amputation and like <laughs> all these different things that um, you know we we not, didn't necessarily have archaeological evidence for um, in America before this. So you know, keep in mind, seven thousand years two years ago is a long time ago. So um, this is a kind of an illustration of what a burial might have looked like. Um, and here, here are some of the archaeologists <laughs> examining um, one of the brains. So they did try to recover DNA from uh, the brains, uh, but it was very fragile. Um, it was more fragile than the specimen, the DNA specimens they were re able to recover from the bones. So from the bone DNA, they were able to determine that Wendover people uh, basically are not related to any other known historic group or pre prehistoric group that we know of, nor are they directly related to Native Americans. So their ancestors probably died out or their population was reduced to a point where their genetic markers weren't passed on. But they do have uh, the genetic markers showing that they are related to ancient peoples from Asia. So it just is further support for all the DNA evidence that we've accumulated in recent years that uh, people migrated to the Americas from Asia. Um, here's another one. They're looking at some x-rays. Um, now, they didn't just find tools in the burials. They found some really interesting decorative items as well. Um, they found necklaces, um, and they also found these bird bone tubes, which are very thin. They're, since they're made out of bird bone, they're extremely delicate. Um, and we know they aren't beads. Um, it's kind of hard to tell the scale from this picture, but uh, they're about, you know, a few inches long and they don't have the wear pattern of beads. So archeologists aren't totally sure what these were used for, but there's some different theories because um, as you can see from the photo, they are really like intricately decorated. So obviously these had some sort of importance. Um, could they have been used as pipes? Um, could they have had some sort of like ritual purpose or ceremonial purpose? Maybe something in like um, other cultures where you see like shamans like blowing smoke on people during rituals or during healing um, ceremonies, something like that. We're not totally sure and we probably will never know. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mo, for sharing about the book, um, Life and Death at Windover. Uh, that's actually the book that I recommend um, if you want to learn more about this because it's really good um, in terms of its readability and its storytelling. Um, Glenn Doran also wrote a book um, on Windover and or you know actually many authors combined uh, but that's from a more <laughs> like archaeolo like hardcore archaeologist um, perspective like Rachel K. Wentz wrote a book called Life and Death at Windover that is great um, and it's just like her storytelling is really good and she draws you in and she tells you all the most interesting things about the site. Um, definitely recommend it. So at the end of this, what they had found after three field seasons was that um, there was at least 168 um, individuals buried here. And um, there's more, like there's more. They, Doran estimated that there's, they only uncovered like about half of the Pond Cemetery. So we know that there's more people buried there. But um, over the next few years after these, this happened, um, state and federal laws were passed protecting um, Native American cemeteries and burial sites and all of that from um, any kind of desecration, which is great because as we know, that's a, been a huge problem throughout history. Um, so uh, wonderful, but um, this, probably would not have happened um, after, you know, this excavation and all the things we learned from it, we probably wouldn't have if it um, had to been discovered just a few years later. So it really was kind of perfect timing um, for, for being able to have some knowledge about ancient peoples um, who were living in Florida. Um, any questions about Windover before I talk about my next story? Um, there's just so much to talk about for Windover. I'm not even touching on <laughs> everything that they found. Um, it was like, it's, it's a massive site. It's fascinating. Were they from the Stone Age? So no, uh, these people are actually from a period called Early Archaic. Um, 
about a, a range of about uh, you know ten to five thousand years ago um, in in the Americas. Um, I've also heard them called uh, Paleo Indian, um, but there's a lot of different terminology and um, yeah. Uh, have any groups claimed their remains? Um, no, they have not. So, um, like I said before, their DNA showed that they're not related to any known Native American groups. Um, so I'm not totally sure how a claim on tr trying to repatriate their remains would work, although I know poten potentially uh, some groups might be interested given that, you know, these ancient peoples are, you know, potentially, you know, uh, at least uh it, you know in some sort of spiritual sense the ancestors of this land so but the short answer is no um okay so oh hold on we got a few more questions what was their average height that's a great question i don't know off the top of my head i would imagine that they were i don't know i i was gonna say i imagine they're a little shorter <laughs> but <laughs> i that would be a wild guess what happened to the developer did he sell the land um, I believe he, he did develop around Windover. Um, it was actually, um, the developer was, um, uh, his last name was Swan, and it was him in combination with um, the son of the Eckerd's founder. Um, and actually they were given some like big archeological war awards from the state and archeologists being like, good job, you know, you didn't just pave over this, like, thank you <laughs> for being a good citizen. Um, but they did go on to develop a community around it. And actually, if you go to the site now, um, it's kind of in a residential neighborhood. Actually, it might even be on private property. So I don't know um, if, you know, if you really should go back there. I did, but, you know. Um, okay, so we're going to move on for time sake. Um, oh, this is also, this is sort of a artist reconstruction of what a Windover person might have looked like. Um, but again, you know, we're not entirely sure. Okay, so we're skipping way ahead here. That was 7,000 years ago. We're gonna skip ahead. Our next story takes place during the Civil War. So uh, I'm not an expert on the Civil War. There are people who just study the Civil War. <laughs> um, and that's all, like there's so much to know about it. Um, and there's even so much to know about the Civil War in Florida. But something that I was tasked to research at one point was um, Central Florida specifically and its role in the Civil War. Um, and if you've ever been to the museum, uh, you know that when you come to like chronologically where the Civil War should be, what it talks about is cattle. Um, and that's because during the Civil War, um, Central Florida itself, um, there weren't a lot of people here, but there was cattle and cattle writ ranchers, people like um, Jacob Summerlin, who sold cattle um, to the Confederate Army and supplied, uh, supplying the Confederate Army with beef, essentially. So that is one aspect of the story, but <laughs> I'm going to tell you about another aspect that I find really interesting, um, and that is uh, the story of the Union blockade. So <laughs> this is an illustration sort of of the, of the time of what the um, blockade was meant to do. Basically, it was meant to cut off um, the South supply lines. Um, Florida and as well as other places in the South, uh, the major export was cotton. That was sort of the money maker. And for Florida, turpentine was a close, you know, was a, you know, a second to, to cotton. And the South needed to be able to export this in order to make money in order to bring in um, weapons and manufactured goods um, to support um, the Confederate Army. So the Union thought that by cutting off, um, you know, making a blockade basically and cutting off ships from being able to, uh, you know, go to Cuba, go to Europe, uh, that that would kind of put a stranglehold on the Confederate Army. So they implemented this plan and um, in Florida, what that essentially meant was uh, the like, major port cities um, like Jacksonville, St. Augustine, um, Pensacola, um, these uh, cities were, um, they, there was a blockade in place, but they were also eventually taken over by the Union. Um, and 
no, uh, no ships <laughs> supplying the Confederacy could come and go from those ports. So they had to find an alternative. If you haven't looked at Florida's coastline recently, <laughs> um, there's tons of little inlets and bays and harbors. And basically throughout the war, uh, Florida's coastline remained porous. Um, there were smuggling was a big business and blockade runners would go to these little uh, little uh, little places in their sort of smaller um, lighter uh, vessels and run the blockade um, and there was a lot of people caught by the union but there was also a lot of money in it if you weren't caught so this is um, there's some debate among scholars about how this actually affected overall the Confederacy's like cause, their, you know, or the cause of their downfall or whatever. Um, but one thing that is not <laughs> as ambiguous is its effect on the people of Florida, the, the citizens. Um, residents of Florida um, at this time saw um, good shortages and had a really hard time getting supplies because of the of the blockade. Um, here's just an example of an illustration. Um, it, mainly the, the, the people who are running the blockade were doing so in these really small ships. Um, and they needed to find, um, if the Confederacy wanted to be able to land supplies in Florida, they needed to find a port that would be big enough to land a cargo ship, but small enough or shallow enough um, to um, enable them to, you know, hold off the Union warships. Um, and that's what they found in Mosquito Inlet, which I will tell you about more in a second. But I want, want to also show you this map just to give you an idea of how unpopulated South Florida was. And when I say South Florida, basically everything south of what we now call Central Florida, but Central Florida and everything below us uh, was extremely sparsely populated. Um, Central Florida was the third um, state to secede, um, and that was mainly because of uh, the people who were had plantations in the Panhandle and northern uh, Florida, um, and yeah, like they, they were essentially the people who led Florida into the war. Um, everything else below, <laughs> below that um, is, I think this map, it says under two inhabitants to the square mile, um, and you know, even that's generous. Like the whole, the, a lot of the coastline along Brevard County was, um, nobody, nobody was there. <laughs> so um, they decided after, um, after these um, port cities were taken, um, the Confederacy would look for another place where they could land some supplies. And they looked at Mosquito Inlet. Today, it's called Ponce de Leon Inlet. It's near New Smyrna. And this is actually, this is a photo um, from New Smyrna that was taken, it's not of, quite of the time, but it can kind of give you an idea of what it looked like. Um, it was big enough to, like I said, to land a cargo ship, but not so big, or it was kind of shallow. Um, so the warships couldn't really make an attack. Um, so what they did, decided to do, they decided to, to land as an, this huge supply of cargo there. Um, and it was called, uh, the, the ship was called the Kate. And it was carrying about 6,000 firearms and tons of other supplies, medicine, blankets, shoes, a ton of ammunition. They land at New Smyrna um, and you know, everyone, everyone from the town and um, who knows about this is kind of rushing to the beach in order to, they had to very quickly move the supplies away from the coast because the longer they sat out there, the more likely it was to be attacked by the Union soldiers. And actually they did have to fend off um, an attack, but they were, they rebuffed the Union and they were able to get all the supplies um, further inland. But at that point, <laughs> at that point, there's this journey uh, that they have to undertake to actually get the supplies somewhere. Um, as you saw from this, um, at these li the lines um, on this map, those are where the railroad is. They're nowhere near <laughs> where uh, they landed these supplies. So they have to go by wagon, by like in a kind of a relay form. They have to go by um, steamer to, in order to get, and then by wagon again after that, in order to even get these to a place where they could load all these supplies onto a train in order to be dispersed to where they need to go. 
So, and you know, there, there, there's just nobody there. So um, they, they move these supplies in. The problem is um, the, the people of New Smyrna have been deprived of goods for a very long time because of the Union blockade. Um, and they start pilfering uh, what's there. Um, even the, the uh, troops that are assigned to like guard the shipment start taking things. There was at least one um, officer who was um, found to be taking stuff and selling it. Um, like it was rampant and it was, it became a great concern to the Confederate uh, generals who were in charge of this shipment. Will there be actually anything left or will the whole shipment just disappear uh, before it ever gets to, to the front lines? <laughs> so they sent an investigator to try and figure out where all the supplies were went. And, you know, there's all these people of New Smyrna with new shoes and, you know, like, oh, I just found these, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> they were able, or officially they recovered all the web, all the weapons. Um, unofficially, there were still some weapons missing. Um, and <laughs> tons of the other goods, the blankets, the medicine, the shoes, the, like the commercial products um, just ended up in the hands of <laughs> Central Floridians. <laughs> um, and it was kind of a huge embarrassment um, for the Confederate Army at that point and probably put them off Florida for a while, at least in terms of um, trying to bring supplies through Florida because um, that was, uh, they didn't really, they didn't try that again. <laughs> uh, they landed at more like reliable ports <laughs> or, or yeah, more, more well-organized ports uh, from then on. Um, but I always thought that that was a really interesting story. Uh, uh, the one you normally hear is about cattle, and this one is just something different that I personally had never heard before. Um, Hillary asked, why did they pick New Smyrna again? So they were looking for a port um, that was big enough for them to land a cargo ship. A lot of the blockade runners and smugglers used like really small like schooners and like, I, I don't know all the naval terminology, but small ships that can go in and out of really small uh, inlets. So they wanted to be able to land this huge shipment there. <laughs> um, so they picked, they picked uh, Mosquito Inlet because that sort of fit their needs. Um, but and yeah, given that all the other ones were taken over by Union soldiers. So um, it was sort of a failed experiment, but um, you know, I, you kind of have to appreciate the resourcefulness of the, um, you know, the, these people who were under extreme hardship because they couldn't get any supplies, you know, and all this stuff just shows up on the beach. Like, so anyway, um, I think that's my, okay, that, yeah, that's my last slide for this story. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on to the next one unless you guys have more questions. Um, how are we doing on time here? Okay. I always go over time. I'm going to try to be on time today, guys. Okay. So my next story <laughs> um, is about a man who I first read about um, in Gore's History of Orlando. So I was just reading, uh, you know, reading through Gore, and I stumbled upon this chapter about this guy named Augustus Nicholson. Um, and it talked all about how he was sort of this wild man um, who collected like alligators and snakes and sold them to zoos and traveling shows. And he was also, a, you know, a, a taxidermist. Um, Eve Bacon, um, in her history of Orlando, calls them calls him the first taxidermist in Orlando. And it talked about how um, his technique for capturing snakes. Um, if he didn't have like a pole with a noose handy, he would um, distract them with a handkerchief and then just quickly grab them and put them in his pocket. Um, like this is a man who clearly spent a lot of time in the Florida wilds and I just became fascinated. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit more about his story. Uh, this is a postcard we have of him in the collection. Um, and here he is uh, milking rattlesnake venom. So Nicholson came in the 1880s to Orlando and he set up shop as a taxidermist and he was the go-to guy 
Um, if you were either a resident or a tourist and you'd caught an alligator or like shot a really long snake on the street or you'd caught some gigantic fish, like he was the guy you would go to to get that thing stuffed as a souvenir of your of your adventure he was also the person who you would call if you needed to go on sort of like an expedition <laughs> if you wanted to go out and collect um some sort of specimens or like you wanted to go in out and explore you would hire him as your guide because he knew where you know where all these animals live and he could provide equipment and he he was your he was your man um, and notably, he served as a guide for um, Mary Cynthia Dickerson, who was the first curator of uh, herpetology at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and when she was doing a display on, on Cyprus environments at the museum, and she decided, I need to go down there and collect some um, specimens myself. And she hired him to take her, to take her around. Um, and they went out and of course he's showing her here here's where you find the turtles here's all these different species of lizards you know here's all these things um, <laughs> and he wrote about it for the Orlando Sentinel and it's fascinating um, it's really interesting to hear his perspective on one of um, the first uh, sort of like a, a prominent female scientist of her day um, and according to him, she was all, quote, business, 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 which I take it to mean he tried to, you know, be very friendly and she just wanted to do her work. <laughs> but that's my editorializing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the situation was. But his writings are really great. Um, and it, I also, I wrote an article about him as well for uh, reflection. So if you have a chance to pick that up, there's more about his writings in there. Here's him catching some rattlesnakes. Um, here's a brochure we have in the archives from his store. Um, we believe his store was in downtown. It was on, or his first store anyway, um, on Church Street. Um, I've not been able to pinpoint the exact location of that. Um, that's according to Bacon and Gore that it was on Church. Um, and he was apparently <laughs> asked to leave downtown after an alligator escaped and knocked the fence down and like alligators and snakes escaped into downtown. Uh, so after that, after he was asked to leave, um, he moved to his store to Division, which is where he stayed. Um, but this is a brochure kind of listing all the different things he had <laughs> available or things I, he, he could catch. Like he did store animals like in both in his house and behind his house um, in like pens and stuff. Um, but he could also go out presumably and catch any of these bird species for you. There's like over 30 species of birds listed on this. Um, at the time, birds were hunted um, in the millions for their uh, feathers, for their uh, ladies plumed hats and things were, were all the rage. And, uh, there was so much money to be made in hunting, um, you know, plume hunting. So uh, around that time, though, the Audubon Society also was forming and, you know, trying to pass laws to protect these birds. But during Nicholson's day, it was still kind of the wild, wild west. And um, in one story, he, uh, he was interviewed because he was bringing 19 pelicans on, the tr on a train back from Tampa where he he'd caught these pelicans. And um, <laughs> the passengers were like, what? what the heck or is with all these pelicans so they interviewed him for the newspaper and he said some of them would go to zoos um and you know he was he was a man of that of that time but he truly did on the other hand he truly did love nature um so he's interesting to read about and the his the alligators you see in his brochure are priced by how big they are <laughs> so it says a dollar for a two-foot alligator fifty dollars for a 12-foot alligator i'm not sure if that means stuffed or alive um probably alive i would think I, but i don't know um it doesn't say anywhere on the brochure um what it was and there's all these prices for different kinds of snakes as well um and there's also just other florida animals that he could catch so like there's a wolf a deer a monk you know uh like all these different things gray fox raccoons so um he was sort of uh sort of an interesting character now, um, he had uh, five kids, um, he and his wife, Alice, 
And when I first saw this photo, I thought that this was Augustus because it looked so much like the other photo that I showed you of him milking snake venom. But this is actually his son, Delmar. And I've, in, since I researched Augustus, I sort of went down the rabbit hole of looking into Delmar's life because he's also a really interesting person. Um, his nickname was Radio Nick because he was a radio engineer and a broadcaster in Central Florida. He was really well known as a businessman and he actually also ran for city commissioner and won. Um, so he was a really well known guy in, in a lot of different arenas, <laughs> but um, like his father, he also had a fascination with nature, um, probably passed on to him. Um, actually, I, I was talking with a descendant of Augustus Nicholson, um, and uh, she was talking about how um, even the daughters in the family, there was, I think, two boys and three girls, I want to say, um, and uh, she was talking about how um, one of the family stories was that when when all of these animals escaped, um, the kids who, <laughs> the kids were, were in their young teens at that point were sent out to capture them, um, and uh, yeah, they all grew up knowing how to handle animals. So this is him with some, just him with some fish. Um, oh, this is Delmar Nicholson though with his pet uh, pet crane named Jim. But Jim was actually a girl, so I don't know if Jim was named before he knew that, but this is Jim with Jim's eggs, <laughs> um, and he's feeding him bread. Um, and the story I want to tell you uh, about him, about Delmar, is that he tried to start a zoo in Orlando. Uh, this is him posing probably at the zoo sometime in the 1930s, but basically he tried to start a zoo in Orlando in the midst of the Great Depression. Um, it was 1934. He, you know, there was some talk about starting a zoo and he just jumped on board. He was all in for this zoo. Um, and he became its first manager and president. He got money from the Orlando City Council. He got tons of donations for this zoo. Um, and it was never totally finished and kind of ended up falling into disrepair. Um, it's a fascinating story. I, I plan to write a follow-up um, article about it for, for Reflections just because there's so much to talk about. Um, I don't even have time to, to tell you all the wild things that happened with the zoo. Um, but here's a photo of it under construction. It was in downtown. It was right next to the train tracks. <laughs> the idea being that as tourists are coming through uh, on the train, they'll look out the window and say, oh, that looks like such a lovely place to visit. <laughs> <laughs> and come and visit the zoo only it was never totally looked the way that um they envisioned it looking because um the time and effort and money required um it, it was just it was too much it was too much for them to to complete it especially at a time where uh, people were kind of strapped financially so um, here's another photo of one of the enclosures that actually got completed. Um, uh, thank you, Frank Billingsley, for uh, lending me this image. This is from a postcard. Um, if you have any photos of the zoo, I would love to hear from you uh, because I'm looking for more photos. We have a couple in our collection of the zoo under construction, and there's some on Florida Memory um, and other places, but um, there's not that many, and I would love to see what it looked like because um, the, the reports vary. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it looks so professional, it looks so great. But then just a few years later, um, people are saying it looks like the ruins of Pompeii. It's like, this is not what I thought of when you told me there was going to be a zoo. <laughs> so um, by 1938, the zoo was pretty much defunct. Um, the city decided to close it down. It was going to cost too much for the upkeep of it. And the animals that were there, I don't know what happened to all of them. They might have gone to the Kissimmee Zoo or the Sanford Zoo, um, or they might have been released back into the wild. Um, the whole story of how they populated the zoo is a whole other thing. Um, basically, like people just brought animals that they had caught or like animals they thought would be fun pets, like raccoons that did not, or monkeys that ended up not being fun pets. Um, <laughs> and that's sort of how they filled up the zoo. Um, Delmar would go out and catch animals and things like that. Um, there, he did bottle raids a fawn there. Um, and there, like in the tradition of his father, there were definitely animal escapes. <laughs> um, some deer escaped, a fawn escaped once. I don't know if it was this fawn in the picture, 
but there was a fawn that escaped and he feared that it had been eaten by dogs, but it was eventually found in some lady's garage. So yay, it lived. <laughs> um, there were monkeys that escaped. Um, and, and this was just in a four year period. He's like, this project started in 1934, closed down in 1938. Within four years, there was, there was already so much drama about this zoo um, happening uh, in Orlando. Like some people really, really wanted it and some people really, really didn't want it. <laughs> um, so after the zoo shut down, um, the site, the, most of the structures were demolished, but the city actually did keep the bird cages. Um, in this photo, you can kind of see in the back there, like these big, you know, bars, like that's the, um, the, the beginnings of the bird, where the birds were kept. And if you look in the city directories, it's actually called the city aviary um, for into the 1940s um, until it eventually is also demolished. Um, so it was a very, very short <laughs> experiment in the life of Orlando. We almost had a zoo but not quite. It was, it was, yeah, it, it was kind of doomed to fail, I think, in a lot of different ways. But um, if you want to know more, I really, I, I, I plan to write a lot more about this, uh, because I think it's interesting. And I hope you will read it in, in a future issue of Reflections. Okay, let me pause for questions really quick. See what we got going on here. Uh, he looks like Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> he kind of does. <laughs> Uh, um, okay. Um, all right. So we're going to keep going. Uh, so my next story, this is not actually a story that I researched. My colleague, Whit Winnie Broadway, um, did a story on this, on this, uh, what I'm going to talk about, <laughs> but it was so fun. I had to include it. So, uh, Orlando, if you didn't know, has a very long history of wacky parades. There are many, many, many parade photos in our collection. Um, I also, I did a story recently on the pajama parades of the 1920s, which you can read about. Um, and <laughs> this, uh, this tradition continued um, into uh, the Queen Kumquat Sachet of the 1980s and 90s. Some of you may even remember, some of you may have participated in this event. Um, I was, grew up in uh, Clearwater, uh, so I was not around when this was happening, and when I learned about it, uh, about the story of it, I just, I love it. I, it's, it's perfect. So, the story begins with Bob Morris. He is a writer for the Sentinel, and Bob <laughs> went to the Citrus Bowl parade and thought, this is so corporate. This is just like, Oh man, we, we need an al an alternate parade, you know, something to counter the, you know, sort of stodgy, uh, very like, you know, corporate centric um, parade that is the Citrus Bowl. Um, and he may have also been inspired by Tampa and Miami, who had just sort of done similar alternative parades as well. Um, but he decided for Orlando, we needed our own thing. So he wrote in the Sentinel a personal ad for the city. Attractive, well-endowed city, desperately seeking a good time. Prospective suitors must possess a spirit of foolishness and appreciation of the absurd and the guts to go against the forces of stodginess and convention. And out of this was born the Queen Kumquat Sachet. Um, the very first sachet <laughs> um, took place in, oh gosh, was it 86? 86? I know, I, yes, 86. Took place in 1986. Um, they weren't sure how many people would show up. Um, they kind of were like, okay, well, maybe like our friends will come. <laughs> but uh, thousands of people came to this parade. Um, and there were several rules for who could be in this parade. First of all, there was no like businesses, like no one could like sell a product. It was meant to just be people, just like, you know, the Orlando community essentially. Um, and, uh, you had to have a sign announcing, uh, you know, who you were. Um, and besides that, the rule or the guideline essentially was like, if you're funny enough, you could be in the parade <laughs> or weird enough. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you some photos of uh, some of 
the parade, people who were in the parade over the years, but there were many. And I, I would love to add some more photos of this event to the collection because it became an annual tradition that was much loved and much celebrated. Um, and so if you have photos of the Queen Come Quat Sachet, I would love to um, add them to the collection uh, to preserve the legacy of this <laughs> important event. <laughs> um, oh, also on why the Kumquat. Um, so the Kumquat, <laughs> this is what Bob Morris said about the Kumquat. Um, take it as you will. It says the Kumquat is the noble fruit because it recognizes its limits. It knows it tastes awful and it sees no reason whatsoever to grow any larger than it already is. So take that as you will. But if you're wondering why kumquats, there you go. So these are just some examples of the different, <laughs> different groups that would march in the parade. The Taurus Liberation Front. Um, all these photos, by the way, are courtesy of Jim Manuel, one of our lovely patrons who was uh, generous enough to let me show these. Um, Thief on Vacation. Uh, do not rob, professional courtesy. Uh, I, I assume the Florida Legion of Failures, it says, the sign says Tarzan Land, so I'm assuming that these are like failed <laughs> attractions um, and things like that. <laughs> um, that's what I, I'm guessing. If I'm wrong, please let me know in the chat. Uh, people have seen Elvis recently. Uh, again, as someone who has seen Elvis recently. <laughs> um black velvet art society oh and of course uh captain yola who was a repeat uh person and actually there were a number of people in this parade who kind of made their mark um there was the world's worst musicians who were actually very talented disney musicians but they would just play disney tunes extremely off key um there was an accordionist um who would appear uh every year and um there was also bob's barricades so part of the tradition of the queen kumquat sachet is that the people marching in the parade would give out kumquats to the spectators who would then lob them at the people watching so for several years bob morris who was sort of the you know inventor of all this he would, be, he would be marching in the parade surrounded by all these people in orange vests who would protect him from flying kumquats. They would, you know, just dodge in front of the kumquats they saw flying towards them. Um, and there was also a queen of the parade. And in, I hope you're getting the impression by now that this is an extremely just silly event. So the queen um, could be, anyone essentially it, um it, it was supposed to be like uh, someone with red hair as long as you had red hair um you could potentially be a queen and they were kind of picked randomly and then um they were <laughs> taken around in a kumquat orange convertible um but let me just tell you about some of the other examples of um previous um uh, previous queens because I think you'll get the impression here. Oh, so the, uh, the Grand Marshal. I, I didn't mean queen. I meant, so there is a queen, but there's also a Grand Marshal. So the Grand Marshal um, for the first parade was a two and a half inch Madagascar kissing cockroach. Um, it, it, dead. It was not alive. It was nailed to a board. Um, it was, there was also another year, I think this was 1990, where there was a three-way contention for Grand Marshal between a pig, a woman who said she had the largest breasts in Central Florida, and uh, Bob Morris's neighbor, Jack. So you get the impression. You have the Queen, <laughs> a Grand Marshal, and ev all of these people in between who uh, just are coming out to have a good time. Um, there was an, even a group of just ordinary dudes who marched under the sign, um, like guys who have never been in a parade before and just want to be in a parade. So you see, it, it was sort of a, a, a celebration of the weird and the fun. And unfortunately, um, it, the tradition uh, fizzled out in the 1990s when Bob Morris um, left the Sentinel. 
Um, but I, for one, would be all in favor of bringing this back uh, because it sounds like a really fun time and celebrates the, the weird in all of us. Um, so yeah, there's not much more to that story. Well, actually, you can, if you want to read more, there is more. If you want to read more, you can check out, this is the Reflections magazine that has the article about the Queen Kumquat Sachet, which my colleague Whitney Broadway wrote about, as well as the Windover article that I wrote about. So um, if you have that lying around, um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. So, okay. I think we're on to our last story. How am I doing on time? Did I go really, am I going really over again? No, okay, we're gonna be, we're gonna be good, I think. So the last story I wanna to talk to you about is another one that's of recent memory. So you may, you may have your own stories about this event or you may remember this event if you lived in uh, Orlando at the time. Um, but uh, Orlando City Hall was um, a 33 year old building um, in 1991. Um, and City Hall, it was just outgrowing this space. Um, it was built in 1958 under Mayor Bob Carr and a new City Hall needed to be built. So the current City Hall was built right next to this one. Um, and they decided to, um, you know, to demolition this, this building, um, but to sell the rights to the implosion to Warner Brothers to help offset that cost. So they sold the, the the implosion rights to Warner Brothers for $50,000. And Warner Brothers said, great, we have the perfect film for this uh, implosion. Um, the Lethal Weapon franchise was extremely popular <laughs> and they were coming out with the third movie soon. Um, so uh, demolition experts were hired. Um, they, the, the closest point at which um, the old Orlando City Hall <laughs> was to the new city hall was something like something ridiculous it was like four feet away or something so they had to be extremely extremely accurate and careful about which how they demoed it to make sure that it leaned towards orange avenue instead of hitting the <laughs> hitting the brand new city hall building <laughs> um but also they did also take out an insurance policy i think it was like a 20 million dollar policy on damages to the new city hall so just to be safe um but they did their job expertly uh, for that, but um, then you ha when you have a or filming for a Hollywood movie, you can't just you know implode the building. Like if you look at building implosions on YouTube, you know the building just falls, right? There's no giant explosion. Like there's no special effects. It doesn't look dramatic. Um, so the people filming Lethal Weapon, um, uh, and if you've ever watched the movie, it's the very opening scene of the movie. You don't even have to watch the whole movie. If you just want to see the scene, just pop it on Netflix or wherever it can be found and just watch this scene. Um, basically, uh, the stars, um, Riggs and Murtaugh, um, played by, uh, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, they show up to a, you know, a bomb scare at this building played by Orlando City Hall, um, and they run in and, you know, they find the bomb in the car and, you know, spoiler alert, it explodes, they run out, but it, you know, they escape, but it explodes. So the, the building had to be dressed up for the film. Uh, first of all, it was renamed, um, you see, you can kind of see in this photo, but you see better in later ones, um, ICSI was the, the acronym for the company this, this was supposed to be, International Control Systems, Inc., or something like that. Um, so they dressed it up as this building um, and they had to place these special effect charges to make it look like an explosion was happening. Um, so these are some photos courtesy of Nick Tootin. Um, I saw these on Facebook and asked if I could share them because I'd never seen photos of the inside of the building. Um, but at the time, uh, Nick's father, Randall Tootin, was um, deputy fire chief for the city of Orlando. So that's how... Um, <laughs> He had these images on hand. I'm no expert, but um, those canisters that are set up, um, are, I, those are special effect charges. Um, and they set up all of these, all of these things so that when the, like, uh, when the, there will be a series of detonations so that first you would have um, like uh, debris flying out, like, you know, cork and glass and paper and 
um, there would be an explosion like the like it looked like the wood the windows were blowing out and then you would have like the fiery blast <laughs> um, on several of the lower floors to make it look like a real explosion. Um, here's another photo of the special effect charges set up. I think there was something like over 400 um, special effect charges, something ridiculous, um, but fascinating because it all had to be timed so perfectly with the implosion itself. And they only got one chance. <laughs> if something went wrong or something didn't go off right, too bad, so sad, there's no building anymore. <laughs> so they had to get all of the timing perfectly right um, in order to get this sequence shot. Um, here is a photo from our collection um, showing the, the initial fiery blast. Um, and now here you can see it starting to implode. And here it is on the ground with the brand new city hall right behind it. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and there wasn't a scratch on the new city hall. So good job, people did their jobs. Um, so one final thing about this that I love is that the mayor at the time, Bill Frederick, actually has a cameo in the movie. Um, if you watch the whole explosion sequence, um, right after Riggs and Murtaugh run out of the building, um, the bomb squad shows up <laughs> and there's this like kind of annoyed bomb squad leader guy who just kind of clap, gives them like a slow clap and says, bravo. And that is Mayor Bill Frederick, <laughs> um, mayor of the city of Orlando. And so here's a photo of Mayor Bill Frederick with the stars as well as the other uh, bomb squad um, cast. So I just love that. I think it's a, it's not something most people watching this movie would know, but now you guys know, um, and you know, a fun fact to share with your friends. So I think that's it. I think that's all my stories um, today, but um, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Uh, I'll stay on to answer anybody's questions. Um, otherwise, thank you and have a great day. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope to do more uh, presentations. Uh, if you have ideas for future presentations, let me know. Because, um, yeah, um, this, they're fun.